And we're live. What's up, everybody? I'm Cameron Gamble. I'm the community marketing manager here at BD Outdoors, and we're here to talk about surf fishing. This is Bit from the Beach, our surf fishing webinar, and I'm here with Ira Waldman, aka Intern Ira, and uh, he is the one who is in charge of publishing our article series, Shorebound. So Ira, why don't you tell everybody about Shorebound? Totally. So Shorebound is a bi-weekly, bi-weekly article that we come out with, covers everything shore fishing or uh, surf fishing. Um, articles come from local guides, industry professionals, avid surf fishermen, covers a variety of topics, everything from say surf fishing road trips, bait presentation, or you know seasonal changes, moon phases, all of that. Uh, these articles come out every other Monday. You can find them under the surf fishing section on our website, and they're bound to make you a better surf fisherman. Awesome, man. Cheers. All right. Well, so we're here with our panel of surf fishing experts. Um, they're going to spread their year's worth of knowledge and experience. We're going to pick their brain a little bit so we all get better at surf fishing. So first, um, I want to introduce Bill Varney. Once you wave to everybody there, Bill. So Bill, you might know him from his book, Surf Fishing, The Lightline Revolution. He brings to the table year, decades, decades of knowledge and experience in the surf fishing realm. If there's any fish from the beach, Bill has caught that fish. So next we have Benji Kim. Benji, you want to give a wave to everybody? Yeah, what's up, dude? So that's Benji. Benji has a successful YouTube platform. Um, he has over 10,000 subscribers on YouTube, and uh, he's mostly known for catching halibut, white sea bass, calico, and sand bass. And then uh, lastly, we're joined by Anthony Canoli. Anthony, you want to wave? What's up, man? So Anthony's our tackle expert here. He's a longtime fisherman, has a history on the sport boats from the beach, inshore, offshore, you name it. Anthony's been there. Um, so he's bringing us all these, all this knowledge from Save On Tackle in LA. Um, so yeah, and hey, thank you to all the members who are here live watching this happen. Uh, the chat box is live down below, you know, fire up, you got any questions? Um, we got a moderator here shooting them through to me. If it's a relevant question, we'll talk about it, you know? <laughs> um, and remember, there's a giveaway at the end too. We got some stuff from our buddies at Costa. Uh, we're going to do a little fun raffle question, see who can shoot through the quickest answer, and we'll be giving some stuff away. So I'm going to pass the torch down to Bill. Bill, why don't you introduce yourself, let everyone know your history and why you're here. All right. Thank you, Cam. Um, I'm Bill Varney. You might know me from my book, Surf Fishing, The Light Line Revolution, or any one of the four or 500 um, articles I've had published through Western Outdoor News, who I wrote for for years and Fish Taco Chronicles and so on and so forth. I'm a fourth generation, um, uh, not only Californian, but from Los Angeles. My family moved to Los Angeles in 1866. We lived at uh, Vermont and Exposition, which is where the USC campus uh, is. And it was probably some of the closest houses to the beach in, the, in those days, long time ago. And uh, both my, my dad and my uncle and my grandfather, and I'm sure my great grandfather, we were all surf anglers and just anglers in general here in Southern California. I was lucky enough in the late 1960s to be introduced to a guy named Fred Oakley, who was at the time the world champion, uh, casting champion. He was the seven time world champion. He also held quite a few record state and uh, IGFA records for fish over the years. And he was the bait collector for surf fishing bait from Santa Barbara to the Mexican border. And I worked for him for about seven years. So I learned a tremendous amount from him. And then of course, put all of that into place in, in fishing, but really, you know, figured out like in the 1970s, really about 76 is when we kind of started going to a lighter line uh, fishing in the surf because, you know, we looked at it and we were, we thought to ourselves, if I was fishing in a lake and I was fishing for fish that were six ounces to 10 pounds, why would I use 40 pound test and a 12 foot rod and a jig master reel? Why wouldn't I downsize my equipment? So that's what we kind of began doing in the seventies. And by the time the eighties and nineties came by, we had pretty much perfected it. And a lot of people have picked it up since then. And it's a great way to enjoy the beach. Awesome, Bill. Oh, yeah. We really appreciate you um, coming on to this and sharing all your knowledge. We really appreciate it. Uh, Benji, give us a little introduction, a little bit about you. Thanks, Sarah. Um, well, I started fishing um, as as a kid, uh, trout fishing the Sierras, as well as uh, just 
local parks, bass fishing with my two cousins, Andy and Richard. And to this day, um, they're the ones that taught me so much about fishing. I fell away from the sport for probably a good 15, maybe 20 years, maybe 15 years. Um, during those 15 years, I fished way more casually. And uh, in my mid thirties, I had this urge to just want to come back to the game. And at that time, Irvine Lake had just closed in Orange County and I'm born and raised in Orange County and Orange Lake, um, Irvine Lake had just closed. And so I was kind of like, shoot, man, like, where do I fish? And, um, and I just, it just hit me. Like my uncle used to fish the surf um, when we were kids and I, I'm like, dude, the beach is all around us. So I walked into a local taco shop, saw Bill's book, <laughs> um, picked it up. And that was really, um, I mean, that book, I mean, I really love the idea of light line surf fishing. Um, that was really new to me. And it was a really cool concept of fishing, like basically tr trout style, if you want from the surf. And so, um, that kind of laid the foundation for my addiction. And, um, from there, I just, you know, for the past probably maybe five to seven years, um, just been going hard from the surf as well as some other things. Um, life circumstances uh, gave me an opportunity to dream. And so that's kind of how my YouTube channel was born. Uh, how cool would it be if I could actually do this? And so my passion is to um, educate and pass down the things that I've learned. Um, and Anthony's, Anthony, who's going to speak, has basically taught me everything, but I'm still learning to how to catch a fish. So one of these days I'll catch <laughs> one. <laughs> um, but yeah, um, yeah, so I've just sunk a lot of time. Um, you know, targeting Corbina is is a big passion of mine. And then halibut came along and I've gotten lucky with a few white sea bass. And so um, I try to, you know, I, I think I'm fairly diverse um, and uh, just do my best to pass that knowledge on um, to anyone that might be wanting to figure it out um, themselves. So thank you. Awesome. Yeah. No, if, to all the people watching out here, if you haven't seen Benji's YouTube channel, it's pretty rad. You know, he's got like the, the new era text on the video showing everybody what's what. And uh, you do a lot of filming, like with the GoPro head mount and things like that. So it's like that firsthand, you know, you watch it and you really get the experience. It really shows an angler what they ought to do. And that's rad. So, um, yeah. So, all right. Yeah. Anthony, man, why don't you give a little introduction? Tell us about yourself and fishing and how you ended up being so such a big part of Save on Tackle. Right on. Thank you, guys. Um, I grew up fishing. You know, that's uh, always been a part of my life and chasing different fish around the country and uh, just exploring. Um, you know, I found saltwater when I was about 14 and just never left it. Uh, started working on boats pretty young and just kept carrying through with that. Um, I was working on a boat and the Save on Tackle, one of the owners came out and they did a charter and got talking to him and uh, that led to a job opportunity and that's where I'm at now is selling fish and tackle and that gives me a lot more time to spend with my family, which was the ultimate decision, you know, the, the, the reason behind the decision to get off the boat was to spend more time with the wife and kids. Um, but it's pretty cool. I'm still involved in the industry. I still get to kind of follow my passion and chase different types of fish around and, you know, help people follow their passion and, and find their own fish, which is pretty cool. Awesome, man. Yeah, that's, that's rad how the, uh, how the uh, sport fishing community is like that, right? You meet certain people and I'm, I'm in a similar situation. That's why I'm here at BD. Same thing. I was on the sport boats and stuff like that. And um, eventually it led me here. It's the same thing. I'm in the industry, but you know, spending time with the girlfriend and cat. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, man. Well, I'm super stoked you guys are here. I was stoked you guys are here. Um, so to everyone watching, we're going to talk about four main things today. We're going to go through the ideal rod and reel to fish from the surf. Uh, we're going to talk about rigging. What's the best styles? What's the best way to rig? Uh, we're going to talk about bait, mainly where to find it, what to find, how to look for it, how to treat it once you have it. And then, you know, maybe even where to buy it if you're looking for something frozen or from a shop. And then we're going to round it out with finding fish from the beach. Probably one of the most important steps is once you get to the beach, you don't just want to toss a line out right in front of you. You need to be strategic and find a place that there's going to be fish. And there are a lot of keys in the elements that are going to tell us where they're going to be. So, uh, yeah, let's just start off right away. Yeah. So our first segment is going to be the tackle segment. So Anthony, this is start to kind of 
direct at you just because you have experience in a tackle shop, but let's go over rod, length, power, action, um, everything you look for, maybe materials, um, brands, any recommendations, and then also real size, line, corrosion resistance, everything that you think is important when choosing the best rod and reel line for the beach. Absolutely. Um, one of the things that you want to look at or, you know, communicate when you're shopping is uh, what you guys want to catch. If you guys want to go target that light line stuff for Corbina and Perch and, and Croker, you know, just let us know because we're going to recommend like a nine foot rod, probably something rated six to 12, a nice soft tip. So we're not pulling a lot of hooks and they're not feeling that, that pressure when they're mouthing that bait. Um, you know, if you're going to go through a lucky craft all day or, or a hard metal jig or something like that, and you just want to cast all day, we can definitely go shorter, um, like a seven and a half or even an eight foot rod are more than fine for launching those hard baits out there. Um, and just doing the repetitive casting and walking, it's a little less cumbersome than the, the nine foot rods. And we'll be looking for something like a medium heavy, you know, something appropriate for a jerk bait or a treble hook. Um, and then you have the sharks and rays and other stuff where you might want to go a little bit heavier. Um, so just let us know what you guys are looking for and we'll go that, you know, recommend different brands based on what you're uh, specifically looking for. But the two big ones for us are halibut fishing, um, you know, that eight foot, nine foot. Uh, the Phoenix Feather is one of my favorite because it's so lightweight and pairing that up with a 3000 size reel. So you have a lot of line capacity. Uh, the reels that I've been recommending a lot of are the Daiwa Fuego. Uh, bang for your buck right now, it's definitely the number one on the market. Um, it's a hundred dollar reel that's mag sealed. That's pretty incredible. There's no, nobody else offering anything close to that. So just for longevity and functionality and taking it to the surf where it's going to get beat up really, really aggressively because of all the salt content and sand content in that, that environment we're fishing. And we've all had that moment where you get a big halibut coming up and it flops off right at the surf line half the time you drop your rod and go try to catch that thing. So there's a good chance your gear is going to be in the sand um, at some point or submerged in the salt water at some point. So definitely that's the reel I recommend for longevity and just overall performance. It's super lightweight. Couldn't be happier with having an offering in that price point. But at the same time, I mean, it's a hundred dollar reel. It's not a cheap reel. Um, there's plenty of other options. Just when you get to those other options, they might not last as long. So you might be replacing a reel a little more frequently. So you'll spend the money over, over the course of a couple of years, or you just invest in the one reel and it becomes your baby for quite a while. Um, for the perch and the Corbina and the croaker, if you like having your own designated setup, uh, the Phoenix trifecta light 903 has been just a standout in that category. Um, great sensitive tip, super lightweight. Pairing that up with a 2,500 sized reel, really hard to beat. Um, again, that trifecta, uh, the trifecta light with that, uh, that Daiwa Fuego, that's uh, one hell of a combo. Um, if you're not a Daiwa guy, you want to go, there's definitely some other options. You've got the Shimano Nasi. Uh, that's another $100 reel. It's going to hold up pretty well in salt water. Um, but I recommend holding the two of them side by side, playing with them. And I think everybody will probably come to the same conclusion, but you'll be able to find a reel that, that kind of fits your budget. Um, some rods that stand out as like really good, you know, newer rods to the market. Akuma's hit it pretty hard with those Rockaway rods. Really nice offering. Price point's very aggressive. Um, sub $200, you know. Uh, Penn came out with the new Carnage Surf Rod. They, they specifically made that for the Perch and Corbina. So definitely another cool rod to keep your eyes open for if you're looking for something a little bit more friendly on the budget. Um, and then the ultimate, you know, probably one of the classics that's been around for probably the longest in SoCal as a surf rod, um, the nine foot Claris. You know, you go get yourself a nine foot Claris. I don't know anybody that started surf fishing and, you know, probably hasn't played with one of those or been recommended one of those. They're $50, $60 rod now. Um, great action. It's, it's just a long uh, salmon rod, you know, that's we're looking for. If you're looking at specific rods that we're, we're using salmon rods, nine foot, really soft tips, light action rated six to 12. And that's uh, that Claris is hard to beat for the price. But when you get to that feather, or the Phoenix trifecta light, you, you really quickly realize you jumped up into a Cadillac setup, super lightweight and incredible backbone. I mean, Benji could probably attest to some of the quality of fish he's pulled in on that rod is just 
does it seems to be able to handle quite a bit more than what it's rated for. <clears throat> awesome. Yeah. I mean, yeah, if you could piggyback on that, Benji, when you go down and you hit the beach, what's in your hand? What are you fishing? You have one or two go-tos, you have a main, main one and a side one, or is it three, four, five? What's your quiver looking like? Got a couple different things in the quiver, but I'd say when it comes down to the two rods that I use for the different kinds of applications, actually for halibut and sea bass, which is kind of big game hunting, um, I actually use the 903, the Tri Phoenix Trifecta Light 903. I love that rod. It's rated medium light. And like Anthony said, I mean, he hit it on the head. And Anthony's the one that introduced me to that rod. So all credit to him um, <laughs> for showing me that rod. But it's a finesse rod. Um, like he said, it's rated 6 to 12, medium light. Um, but the backbone, oops, I mean, I've caught a 32-inch halibut. And that was on the Trifecta Light 903, a 32-inch white sea bass on the 903. Um, and I had zero issues with bringing in those fish with that rod. Um, and so, um, yeah, I mean, that's the first one that I'm going to have. And then when I'm uh, sight fishing Corbina, which is the other thing that I love to do from the SoCal Surf, um, I have the Phoenix Trifecta Light. I'm a Phoenix Trifecta fanboy, um, the, <laughs> the 802L. And so um, it's the eight, eight foot light and uh, that one's rated four to 10. Um, and just significantly lighter. I could probably go lighter than that. I've been toying around with taking some like trout rods out there, like the elixir or dragonfly or something, you know? Um, but, you know, flipping, flipping out into like six inches of water for Corbina, um, you know, the eight foot TRL is the one I go with. So those are the two that I use the most from the surf, depending on the application, um, whether it's halibut or Corbina. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. I mean, yeah. And then, well, Bill, you, so if anyone watching probably doesn't know this, but I actually was up in Santa Barbara last week and Bill and I fished for a little bit together. And Bill, you were there for what, three or four days. And I think I spotted 10 to 15 rods in the back of your car. So <laughs> how are, how are you picking and choosing when you're driving those things in? How, you know, it seemed like you fished the same one the both days we fished. Yeah. Well, well, you know, it is an addiction. <laughs> I've got to keep my eyes on the car. <laughs> um, you know, I, I would definitely agree with Anthony. And if you could see there, I was uh, taking notes um, on some of Anthony's suggestions. You know, in, in the surf fishing world, rod wise, because there's other than the rods that are that I make or my rod maker makes these custom rods, um, there are no real surf fishing rods out there. And so we look for a salmon steelhead rod. Really, those steelhead rods are, are really what have been the backbone of surf fishing for the last probably 20 years or so. Um, and then as far as the, the reels are concerned, those are all really good reels. It's always really good to in the surf to recognize that you don't want to spend two grand on a Stella and drop it in the sand. So it's better to have a hundred dollar reel or a $75 reel or a $50 reel. Shimano makes a couple of good reels for the surf. The Sienna and the Sedona are good. Um, one of my very favorites, which is right here next to me, I uh, can't live without it, is the Pen Battle 2. That's a really good reel for the surf because it's also sea. Uh, in the body. They were the, actually the first manufacturer of fishing reels to seal, get away from the clam shape and seal the bottom of it. Um, and then there's custom, a few custom made rods out there. Our rods that we have custom made, the blank is made by Seeker and Seeker purchased the um, mandrels, which are the um, uh, let's see, how would you explain that? They are the form um, that's used for making rods. They purchase those from Cousins who had manufactured my surf rods for several years there before they went out of business. So there's a lot of really good tackle available and there's a lot of really good tackle available inexpensively. You can get a really nice setup for less than $150 that if you take care of it by just rinsing it off and I use a, a, a old cotton sock and dry my rod and reel off after I'm done for the day, it, it'll last you quite a while. It's really a, a very affordable sport that way. Awesome. awesome. Yeah, I think that's great. I think that's honestly why we're here, right? Because surf fishing is becoming more and more popular in Southern California because to go out on a sport boat, it breaks the bank, you know? Yes. So walking down to the beach with, you know, some white line and a rod and reel, it's a one-time purchase. You're digging up some sand crabs. The next thing you know, you're bit. So yeah, that's awesome. Absolutely. I mean, I think it's like 
probably the epitome of like a, a the great introduction to Southern California fishing. You know, you really don't need much. You don't need that many lures even because you can go forage for whatever bait you need. Um, because likely whatever bait you find at the at your feet will be the best for that beach you're fishing, which is great. Yeah. Um, and so yeah, a real simple setup works fine, and that's kind of what I really enjoy about it. It, it can be so simple and really a great introduction to a lot for a lot of people. Yeah. Well, yeah. Awesome. So, I mean, I, I see us already uh, segmenting into our next rigging segment and we're already talking about baits. So, you know what we're going to do guys, we're going to go ahead and we're going to take a minute commercial break uh, and then we'll come back and we'll start, start the rigging segment. We'll see you in a minute. I'm Benny Ortiz with Shimano, and I'm here to talk about all things slow pitch jigging. Slow pitch jigging. We are a sustainable seafood company specializing specifically in local products caught by my family. San Diego Bay's year-round fisheries. Visit BDOutdoors.com to check out all of our premium featured content and much more. What's up, guys? We're back. It's only been a minute. You missed us already. <laughs> all right. So we're going to talk about rigging, right? So there's all sorts of different kinds of rigs you can do. Um, but there's a couple staples that are really going to increase your chances of landing your desired fish. So one thing Ira can touch on definitely about Shorebound, our article series has talked about one thing you shouldn't really do is be tying knots on the beach, right? When you're at home, what do you want to do before you leave? Absolutely. So in a lot of these articles that we go into, we talk preparations for the beach and a really important thing. I mean, tying four pound, tying six pound. I've tried to do it on the beach. Your leaders are blowing away. You know, you're dealing with such light stuff. It really makes sense to do it at home, do it on a leaderboard, something like that. Um, it really helps. Um, and that's what a lot of these articles are great for, you know, those little tips and tricks. Um, that can just make your day on the water so much better. So Bill, do you want to start us off here with um, some of your kind of the best tips for rigging and what you like to use? Absolutely. So going back just re really quickly to what you said, it's very important to tie your leaders in particular at home. You know, turn on your favorite fishing show or Survivor or the Housewives of Beverly Hills, whatever you enjoy watching, sit under a good light, put on some glasses if you need them and tie, let's say six to 12 liters. I put those liters on, on, on either a little piece of cardboard um, and put a little slit on the top and they slide right around there and clip them on there. Or I have some leader holders. You guys carry them there at Save on Tackle in Santa Fe Springs. Um, and that way you're prepared. That just goes, sits in my top pocket. The thing about surf fishing is surf fishing is very similar to, you know, coming up on a boiler of, of yellowfin or bluefin tuna. It's not going to be there for two or three hours while you fiddle around and have a hamburger. So the same thing with surf fishing. You may have to, you know, you may get a several hour wide open bite, but often you'll get a bite that's maybe 20 or 30 minutes as predicated by the tide, for example. And if you're not prepared and you spend 15 minutes of that time tying a knot, you're going to miss all the fish. So be prepared in advance and do things that are difficult like that in advance at home. So I, I, in surf fishing, I use, generally use two different rigs. The rig that I use probably 90% of the time, the most common rig would be the Carolina rig. And the Carolina rig is a very simple rig. It's made up of a sliding sinker, um, a bead, a swivel, uh, anywhere from let's say eight to 24 inches of, of leader material, which you can't see, right? Cause it's invisible. <laughs> and then a hook. I, think I use a couple of different styles of hooks or sizes of hooks, but here are the rules to remember when you're setting up your Carolina rig. The first thing is, is that the bigger the surf, the heavier your sinker. So if I went down to the beach and it was a windy afternoon, I really want to go surf fishing this evening. I'm going to use a three quarter or even a one ounce sliding sinker. The reason for that is that surf fish 
many of them who have a barbell right on their chin that they rub in the sand and they look for food are always feeding on the bottom. If my sinker is too light, my bait is way up here above the bottom. It's not down where the fish are feeding. They'll never find it. So I always want to err on the side of a heavier sinker than too light. If I was to fish on a day where it's really windy or the current's strong or the surf is big, I'd use three quarters ounce or an ounce. If I was to go fishing in November and it's really calm, we have Santa Ana conditions, the surf is like one to two foot, I might use as little as a quarter of an ounce. So that's the sliding sinker. Below that, I use a bead. I use a six millimeter bead, usually plastic. You can use glass ones if you want. Um, and those beads are normally I use a clear bead in the summer because Corbina have really good eyesight. In the winter, I'll use a colored bead like an orange or red or a green bead, which acts as a really good attractant to perch. The reason that we need that bead there is because when you tie a knot on the top of your swivel, it creates a conical shape, a triangular type of shape, the knot. And what happens when the, there's just the knot and the sinker? is that the knot pound sand into the inside of the sinker, it no longer slides on the line and binds and can easily break because you're using such light line. If we were to use 20 pound test, we wouldn't have to worry about that. So that's what we use the bead for. And then below the bead, I put a um, number 10, a number 12, or a number 14 black swivel. I always use black rather than chrome plated plated, zinc plated, or, or a new brass one, because if that's laying down in the sand and you know how at the beach it's foggy and then it's sunny and it's foggy and it's sunny, every time that sun comes out, if this is laying on the sand, it beats down on it and it shines up through the water. Remember, surf fish got big by being smart, not by being right. dumb. A 20 inch Corbina is probably about 15 years old and it got to be 15 years old by not just jumping on anything it saw. So I use a back black swivel so it lays down in the sand and it's really hard for the fish to see. When it comes to our leader, I use six pound uh, um, fluorocarbon. And the reason I always use fluorocarbon is not because or only because they tell us it's invisible, but primarily because it's abrasion resistant. And in the surf, we have a lot of sand, rocks, surfers, kelp, all kinds <clears throat> of fish that it can rub on and the line can easily break if it's a, if it's a single extruded monofilament. Whereas the um, fluorocarbon is a woven line and it's much greater abrasion resistance. The rule for the leader is that the bigger the surf, the shorter your leader. You don't want to have a long leader in your baits way up here if the surf is big. If the surf's really small and I go once again in November or October, Santa Ana conditions, I could fish as long as a 36 inch leader. And I would want a longer leader there because it's more stealth that way. But if the surf is bigger, the water is turbid or, or difficult to see through, a shorter leader all the way down to eight to 12 inches. And then the last thing that I, I, I use is my is a hook. And that's probably one of the biggest mistakes I see in surf fishing is the hooks that people use. You know, a number two hook is the same size roughly for a, um, to, to use our anchovy or sardine on as a number two hook we'd use in the surf. But the, dis, the difference between the two is the thickness of the shaft and of the hook itself. So I like to use two, there's two types of hooks I like to use in the surf. Um, one is the Gamagatsu 50409, the split shot drop shot hook, very thin wire, very sharp, perfectly J-shaped. You never want an offset hook because once you bait it, your bait will spin on that hook underwater and not be natural. So you want a perfect J-shape. The Gamagatsu makes those. They're super duper sharp. And I'll use a number one for my biggest bait probably 80% of the time a number two or a number four for a grub or a smaller bait. And then another really good hook is these owner mosquito light hooks. They have like a little um, yellow box on them and it says light here because they make a regular owner mosquito and, a, and the mosquito light. They both work well, but these lights are much thinner and very, very sharp. And they're both inexpensive hooks. I pick up several packs of them in one, two, and four, and that's everything you can need for the surf. These hooks are non-anodized black hooks, which means that 
If you need to cut it off and leave it in a fish, which we do a lot of times with perch, it'll rust out in just a few days. It'll rust out very quickly. A hook that's anodized or zinc plated will take maybe a month or month and a half. It'll eventually come out, but these will come out much quicker. And the thing to remember about that is if you go to Anthony and you buy one of these, that it's the uh, Pro Pack that's got like 50 of them in it, whatever you do, put five of them or six of them in a little bag and keep that separate. And that's what you carry with you. Because if you take a bag of these with 50 that you just paid for and you put your little wet, salty finger inside of there, they will all be rusted together in one giant. It looked like a little, <laughs> little Jeep in there after about two days. So that's probably the number one rig that we use. And once again, the hook is super important. And then the other rig that we'll use for the surf is the uni to uni rig, which we'll use for corbina fishing. Just like Benji said, for sight fishing for corbina, where we'll take a, a length of four pound or six pound fluorocarbon, anywhere from the length of our rod to, to maybe 10 or 12 inches long, anywhere in that range, use a uni to uni knot to our main line and have a hook on the end, very sharp, one of these gamagatsu or owner hooks. And then we'll hook a sand crab on there and we'll basically be fly lining just like we're fly lining an anchovy and we'll throw it out in the surf. Now it'll only be a few feet in front of us. It might be 12 feet in front of us. And that's where the biggest fish feed. But the thing is it gives that bait a really mm -hmm. natural look in the surf because it's just rolling back and forth in the surf, just like a natural sand crab would. Wow. wow. Yeah. No, I mean, that's, first of all, the Carolina rig is the go-to for anybody watching. If you have never surfed fish before and you're looking to catch fish, Start with the Carolina rig. Uh, when you touch up on your skills and you can flick out a light bait, go for that fly line setup. But that's insane to me being an offshore fisherman that you're fly lining sand crabs in the surf. Cause like, I don't know, I've been fishing for a few years. I like to think of myself as a skilled angler, but a sand crab weighs not that much. So to pitch it out is, is pretty difficult, but all right. So moving on from that, right. That's just like the typical, go to the Carolina rig, but Benji, you are known for these halibut, white sea bass, calico, and you're not really necessarily getting them on the Carolina rig. What are you doing? What are you throwing? Yeah, I think um, uh, when I first started surf fishing and I started wanting to catch halibut, um, everyone was talking about the Lucky Craft and um, just heard so much about it. And on social media, um, you know, I, I you know, I, I learned a lot from Bill's book and then um, a Facebook group that I'm part of uh, the California surf anglers. I was really like looking at all these posts and it's a great community of anglers helping each other, you know, like a lot of experienced anglers that are helping each other. And so I learned so much there. Um, we'll always be grateful um, for that group. Um, but you always hear about the lucky craft. And, and so I pick one up and I started learning how to fish it. And so uh, I, I always say, especially with my channel and my videos, I always say I'm not the greatest fisherman cause I'm not. Um, but I also like to say, Hey, if, if I could do it, then you can definitely do it. Cause I'm not that good. Um, but here I am getting lucky, you know? And so I've learned a few things along the way, um, but I love throwing the lucky craft. It's the Flashman of 110 is kind of their flagship um, jerk bait product. And um, it weighs like 16.7 grams, really light. I use anywhere from 12 to 15 pound uh, fluorocarbon leader with a 30 pound braid. Again, I'm throwing that on a size 2,500 reel to 3,000 on the Trifecta Light 903. So it's a real finesse setup. And again, the rod really allows um, it to, to load up and throw this thing in the surf anywhere from 30 to 50 yards, maybe 60 yards on a good day. Um, and so, yeah, that's, that's kind of what I've had the most success from the surf, I think, um, doing and throwing the lucky craft, uh, when it comes to color. So the flash Minnow 110 again, is their flagship. It's a uh, real, it's a shallow water jerk bait. So it's a one to two foot di diving, suspending lure. And so, um, you want to work this in real shallow water columns. Um, I like fishing negative tides. Um, I guess we'll talk about that later, but, um, it's, it's a one to two foot diver. So if you're, you don't want to throw this in deep water. Um, you want to use that. You want to fish shallow troughs, small holes, because um, the halibut are bottom. You know they're going to be on the bottom, so you want to get it into their face. It's not rocket science. You swim it past their face, they might bite it. You know, um, and so um, this is the 115, and this is a three to five foot diver, and it's not suspending. It's a sinking lure, and so the 110 and the 115 is all you're really going to need from the surf for throwing the lucky craft. And, um, and so, you know, deeper water, throw the 115, 
shallow water through the 110. Um, and I don't know if we're talking about techniques or whatnot. Um, we could probably talk for hours in terms of, <laughs> yeah. you know, it's, it's, it's real. It's like, it's one of those things where it's like simple, but not easy. And uh, when I was, you know, when I was first really getting into this thing, I was at Save on Tackle before Anthony even knew who I was. And I promise you, he doesn't remember the conversation, but he was super kind to me. Um, a <laughs> noob asking for how do you fish this thing? Um, the slower, the better. Um, slow really? roll. You know, um, I think like on the East Coast and stuff, faster seems to be better. But on the West Coast, how the fishing, the slower you can roll this thing. Um, and again, the rod's real important because it's going to allow you to feel the vibrations of the lure. So the slower you can fish this thing while it has its tight wobble, um, the better the chances of you getting bit. Um, mm. And for me, like, you know, the slow roll works. I, I like to, um, again, I'm fishing water that's, you know, knee deep. And so uh, for me, and with a lot of rocks and a lot of reefs, heavy structure. So I jerk my rod tip up on a cadence of one, two, one uh with pauses in between um and just slow roll it in and a lot of times they'll hit it on the pause and a lot of times they'll hit it on the jerk um but it's just experimenting and figuring out what you know what they want that day color wise mm -hmm. anything bait fish pattern this is the best selling color of all time for lucky crafts the metallic sardine it's just a sardine um and a sardine or the infamous cherry berry this is the 115 but they have this in the 110 too Pearl, white, halibut seem to really like the white pattern. And then the pink bottom. Something about that pink, man. So in my opinion, if you just had to buy two, get those two. Um, and there's a lot of new fancy colors out there. But, you know. Awesome. No, that, that's great. Hey, Anthony, I mean, you know, being so big and save on and stuff, uh, I'm sure a lot of our uh, viewers are wondering, um, how expensive are these lucky crafts? Are they hard to find? And are there any other jigs that are close or any other lures that are close? Or is this like, you know, lucky craft, we're giving them, we're giving them a good shout out right now. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> lucky crafts are fairly easy to find. Um, when I got certain colors are definitely harder to find. So when you see them, you know, it's always good to grab one. Uh, I know Benji sometimes comes in and even though he has a hundred sitting on the wall behind him there, he'll still <laughs> grab one every occasionally. Um, but when he sees, I get restocked on specific colors, but really, I mean, uh, they're the best. And for what we do out here, that slow roll cadence, that tungsten bead they have in there, they just really are one of the best producing baits we have for a jerk bait. There are other jerk baits. I do recommend them. Um, but the, the Lucky Craft is definitely one of my favorite for the saltwater application. Um, just that slow roll. Some jerk baits do really good with the twitch, twitch, pause cadence. Um, but that Lucky Craft with the slow roll, they just really have that dialed in. I'm, you know, the 115, I like it's okay, but the 110 really is the one you want in your arsenal. Um, you know, I do, Benji thinks I don't remember that, but it's hard to forget that 100 question interview I had trying to sell him one lucky craft for 20 bucks. <laughs> um, but the two colors, I mean, he natural bait fish and that white, you know, they're the two, two best. I, I usually recommend the uh, MS anchovy, but that metallic sardine is incredible. Um, and then crocodiles and cast masters, you know, if, if for most of the guys that know me that come in, you know, if you're going to fish somewhere that you haven't fished before, you're fishing somewhere that's pretty rocky and you know there's some good structure around, take a take a six, seven, eight dollar crocodile and cast it out there. You can wind that pretty slow across the bottom, put a single hook on it, and you're less likely to lose that bait while you're learning the structure. And you'll feel that bait dinging off of the structure. And, you know, oh, there's the reef. You know, it's about 50 yards in front of me. Maybe don't throw your lucky craft onto that reef and lose it, you know. Um, so I, that's a big thing for me is it's an expensive bait at $20 for a, a single jerk bait, but, um, there's definitely ways to, to preserve that bait. And there's definitely some affordable options like a cast master or crocodile that you can use to learn the area and not sacrifice the, you know, that, that $20 jerk bait. So make the investment, but, you know, also have some options that you can use to, to learn the structure around your spot. Yeah, awesome. is it all right if I uh, uh, do something real talk real quick about um, other options? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Fast. For halibut um, and bass fishermen um, that are fishing, 
Um, the Texas rig, especially if you're fishing heavy kelp, heavy structure, or it's super, a uh, lot of salad in the water, a lot of seaweed in the water, and it makes it real difficult to throw the hard bait with the exposed trebles. Um, the Texas rig is definitely um, something that everyone should maybe consider having in their arsenal for those kind of days, or just flat out just catching fish. Um, you know, a paddle tail, four to five inch, a four aught, um, a four aught hook with a half ounce bullet head. Um, that's something that seems to work really, really well. Just want to throw that out there. And then the drop shot rig, uh, one ounce torpedo, um, and you can make it weedless if you want and, um, a fluke style bait. So you have the torpedo sinker on the bottom and then you have your fluke style. This is a Z-Man jerk shad and I like it cause it's scented, but, um, zoom flukes doesn't really matter four inches. And I have this rigged weedless and um, the drop shot is definitely, especially if you're newer to halibut fishing, it might be, in my opinion, the easiest way um, to start catching halibut. So mm -hmm. just want to throw those two out there as well. Yeah, no, awesome. Always glad for more, more inclusion. Awesome. Well, you know, so we've gone through the rigging segment here, guys. We're going to snap out to another quick minute break and then we're going to come back with the big seven. So we'll see you guys in another minute. Welcome back. Hopefully you enjoyed that little quick snippet by a couple of our partners. Uh, Costa is the one that's supplying you guys with your raffle prizes. So uh, be stoked. <laughs> Rad. Um, all right. Yes. Yeah, so we're going to talk about some bait here, right? So it's huge in Southern California to be fishing sand crabs and lug worms and all sorts of different things. But um, Bill, why don't you kick us off and uh, tell us First of all, where we should look to find sand crabs and then how we should store them to make sure when we're ready to fish them, they're in the optimal state. Okay, well, um, hopefully we have, what, about four hours left, so <laughs> we'll get started. <laughs> um, so Ira made a really good point, and it's really important in, in surf fishing, besides the fact of all fishing, really, of don't overthink things. As a human being, we overthink things. So, so try to look at everything on the way that a fish would look at it. Now, what Ira said is really important. What foods or what forage or what bait occurs in the area that you're fishing is what those fish are eating, you know? So like we go out tuna fishing and they won't eat our sardines, but we cut one open. It's got little tiny sorries in it. Well, that's what they're eating. So when you go to the beach and you see sand crabs in the sand and you see mussels on the rocks or you, you find some clams, those are the things that they're eating in the areas that you're fishing. You never want to generally in the surf bring something into an area that is not something that they would naturally be eating. That's why a lot of times squid, which works okay in the surf, catches only sharks and lots of times what we would term junk fish. It's because it's not what is predominantly occurring naturally in that area. So sand crabs, for example, in Southern California, there's about three kinds of sand crabs in the world. Sand crabs are all over the place. I found sand crabs in Aruba, Venezuela. I found them in Hawaii, uh, East Cape, Huntington Beach, Santa Barbara, Seattle, you name it. They're all over 
the world. Some occur in colder water climates, some occur, occur in warmer water climates. Where we live in Southern California, what happens is they go into hibernation once the temperature of the water gets below 60 degrees. And then when it comes back up in the spring, which is right around May 1st, maybe sometimes in, in later April, the water will warm up enough right around 60 degrees and they'll come to the surface and that's when you'll be able to begin to find them. When the water gets to about 64 degrees is when they begin to shed their shells. And as they grow, they're just like a snake. They shed their shell to grow another shell to grow bigger and so on and so forth. So in the beginning of the summer, you'll normally find them at the high tide mark at many beaches. Um, a good thing to look for is of course, be birds in the general area, pecking around in the sand, looking for them and feeding on them. Um, and then as the summer goes on, they'll be all, all across the beach. They'll be up by the high tide mark and at low, minus tide, you'll see them out on the uh, sandbars out there and they'll create a bed that might be the size of the hood of a car. And there'll be literally tens of thousands of them there. And they'll be pretty, pretty much feeding and, and, uh, foraging on, on whatever plankton and so forth there is there, and then creating their eggs and then having babies and, and, and moving on. Um, if I was to want to look for sand crabs all year long, and once again, they probably work best in the April, May, June, July, August period of time. But if I want to get them all year long, I just go under any one of California's piers and almost all of the piers, you can find them underneath there because as the waves wrap around the piling underneath the pier, it deposits soft sand, silty sand behind those pilings, which makes it very easy for the crabs to dig into. And then the pilings themselves hold their food that they forage upon. So first place I'd always look is underneath piers. I'd normally go at high tide, try to look at my tide chart and find peak high tides and, and collect them at that time. You can collect them in many ways. You can use a Promar crab net. You can use the Crab and Go, which is a small handheld uh, crab catcher. You can go to the 99 cent store and get a, uh, a sweater washing bag that looks like a net that's got a zipper on the top. You're gonna undo the zipper because once it touches the salt water, you'll never close the zipper again, but you could do that and open it up, throw sand in it, wash it out. Your crabs are right in the bottom of that. You can use a colander. There's many different things that you can use to catch mm -hmm. crabs. Once you do catch them, you wanna wash them off and try to get all the sand off of them. And then you're gonna store them overnight, maybe up to two days, three days at the longest in a dry plastic container. You're not gonna put them in water as they will drown. You don't wanna put them in a sand mixture because they'll be covered with sand, which will get on your hands. And then as Anthony will tell you, it'll become part of your reel at some point. You'll be back over at Savon buying a new reel. So you wanna keep them <laughs> clean. I usually rinse them off at the beach when I take them back down there. And then if you wanna keep them overnight, or up to two days, you take one of your larger ice chests, put the sand crabs in the plastic container on one side of it, take a frozen bottle of water on the other side of it. So the ambient temperature inside of it is around 60 degrees and they'll live fine in there. I will normally at the beach when I catch them, catch you know 20 or 30, you can have up to 50 in possession and then find a piece of kelp on the sand, which is cool and wet and slimy and put that in on top of them, which will keep them cool as the sun beats down on the on the uh, container I've got them in. So that's basically how the sand crabs work. And then of course, when it comes to different months, when you get to the winter months, it's really good to go with clams, to use mussels, which you can collect right off the rocks. And then the ocean has three, the marine environment's got 3000 varieties of worms. So at local tackle shops, you'll find both blood worms and lug worms. And those work not only all year long, but they work particularly well in the winter because that's what surfish are feeding on. They're feeding on those small bean clams that you see at the beach, those millions of shells. They're feeding on those. They're feeding on mussels that are breaking off the rocks and, and they're feeding on, on different varieties of worms. So the very last bait I tell you about would be the sidewinder crabs. Sidewinder crabs are those green and brown crabs, sometimes a little bit orange, burnt orange color that you see running across the rocks. Um, they're all different sizes from the size of a dime up to maybe a silver dollar size or so. And that is what the big perch, whether it's a pile perch or a barred perch or giant walleye perch, that's what they feed off in the winter. So those perch get very close to those rocks in the winter. They want a wave to hit that rock and wash those sidewinder crabs into the water and they'll feast on those. If you want to catch a big perch, you want to use one of those and they're only going to work for you 
in December, January, February, March, when the water's at its very coldest. If you take one and pin one of those on in the middle of summer and throw it out there in a school of fish, they will not look at it because it's not what occurs naturally in the area that they live at that time of year. Hmm. Awesome. All right. So, so here we are, right? We're looking for bait. We're on the beach. We're looking, but also you can go to tackle stores and buy frozen bait, right? So Anthony, give us maybe a little bit of insight to what you can fish that comes from a freezer that prevents you from uh, actually looking for your own bait. If you want to, you want you want to go to the store and buy something frozen. What are you recommending? Um, first, even before the, the bait, I would highly recommend having a pack of Berkeley Gulp camo sandworms in your bag at all times. That's one of the easiest baits to start with while you're going out there looking for bait. You know, you have something that if you can't find sand crabs, you don't have time to make it to a tackle store before you want to go fishing or after work. You don't want to keep worms live somehow all day while you're, you know, and uh, it's a hundred degrees out this week. You know, how are you going to keep them alive while you're busy at work? Uh, those are an incredible resource um, and they, they just flat out produce consistently year round. So great, great bait to have in your tackle box. Um, but in the tackle stores, really, we want to uh, lugworms, blood worms. That's really your go to. If you're fishing some uh, structure areas like Benji is, uh, you have a lot of rocks or reefs. If you get some frozen anchovies or frozen sardines and cut them up into chunks, you'll produce halibut. You'll produce uh, calico, sand bass. And the bass species, especially, no problem with the dead bait. Halibut or scavengers, you know, they'll, they have no problem eating dead bait. Some of your best halibut bites come after a grunion run where you get all those grunion floating around dead in the surf line there. They, they love eating those things. Um, so that's some good options. Your sardines, anchovies, and, you know, the, the blood worms, leg worms, if you want to have some stuff prepped. Um, on the sand crab thing, real quick. If they come in contact with fresh water, they die very, very rapidly. And whether it's condensation from a, a frozen water bottle you're using to keep them cool or whatever. So what, anytime you put those things and you want to keep them alive for a couple of days, make sure they just don't come in contact with fresh water at all. That's that's a huge thing. Interesting. I used to commercial fish them back east. There, back there, there's no limit. So I mean, I'd fill up 60 quart coolers to supply tackle shops in one night, and you put a, a frozen milk jug in there or something and that whole batch is dead in hours wow wow that's crazy well that's crazy you just uh you just brought up the gulp baits because uh one of our guests here reno had asked if uh berkeley gulp sand crabs or any of those similar type baits would work if you can't find any crabs on the beach and you're referencing something very similar right like having the camo what would you say the camo worm the camo sandworm they make a uh mm -hmm. they make like a little three inch camo sandworm um very effective the benji has some benji has some there he has the longer ones they make some shorter ones pre-cut they come in a little ziploc bag awesome um yep uh, this wow. the one bill has there Look they this. have blood worms camo sandworms keep these things in your bag at all times when i take my little i take a tiny little satchel bag down the same bag that bill has in his hand there uh is great because it they don't go bad it takes a long time to go bad you have to leave them open basically there's some oil on them uh it's a nice strong scent i just take those carolina rig them and gently sweep them across the bottom i don't wind i just sweep and then wind the slack in um but just what an effective bait yeah i mean it, it must be it must be effective if two of our three guests get up the second you mention it and they have them sitting in the back of the room they're in yeah Jesus, that's, yeah. What, I mean, for sure. that's what i'm talking about boys that's rad yeah for <laughs> sure yeah absolutely that should be a given in your tackle box awesome all right so we got a question from mark's tv and cyber jake i don't honestly think ira can answer this one how big of sand crabs are we looking for okay so when we when you see us two screwing down on the beach, just like digging, trying to find stuff, you'll find the great big ones. Um, and those just really don't work from what we found. So it's really kind of, I like to think the ones that I like to use are probably the size of the nail on your thumb. Like, I think that's generally um, a good size. I come from like a background in freshwater swim bait fishing. And so my thought process is always big bait, big fish. It uh, doesn't really work in the surf because you'll find the great big sand crabs and as fun as they are to look at, they're not that effective. Um, yeah. So my general rule of thumb is size of the nail, but what do you guys think? Um, Definitely, if you, if you can't find the big ones, you know, use two or three small ones at one time on there. Um, but if you can find something that's maybe three quarters of an inch long, 
that's the the sweet spot right there. Those bigger Corvina I found have definitely they key in on those larger ones. But if you can't find the bigger ones, put two or three small ones on. Yeah, um, just to just to piggyback on there too. Um, I I don't throw the Carolina rig for casting structure so much. Um, when I'm not halibut fishing, I sight fish Corbina in like six inches of water. Um, for me, I'm looking for the biggest stinking crab I can find, and uh, okay, that's, that's that's my go-to. Oh, that's, that's great to know because we've never had luck on the great big ones. Um, yeah, I don't know. I find I find in those uh, those bigger ones. Maybe because I mean, as Bill pointed out last weekend, I was fishing the wrong hook. So now that I now that I got the Gamagatsu right size hook, maybe I would feel it. But I like to have the bar pushing right next to where those eggs are. And I find out with those bigger ones, the eggs are getting eaten off, and I'm winding in my bait, and my crab's missing legs and eggs, but the crab is still fully intact. But all right, guys, so we're already going to be a little bit over time here, which is totally cool. If you if all you guys watching are willing to hang out for a little bit extra, we're willing to talk about it. But we're going to go ahead and cut to another commercial here. One more minute. We're going to come back. We're going to talk finding fish at the beach. I see a ton of questions from you guys, and I would love to answer every single one of them. Um, I, Adam, I'm going to answer your one right now with some information Bill gave me the other day. Whatever knot you can tie the best, tie it. It doesn't matter with this light line. You don't need to be bobbing and weaving, trying a bunch of different knots. Uh, connection knot, uni to uni. Uh, and then for me, I'm an offshore dude. I'm San Diego jam, four pound test, 140 pound test, San Diego jam. So uh, we're going to go ahead and cut to commercial for one more minute and we'll come back and we'll talk about where we look for fish on the beach. I'm Benny Ortiz with Shimano, and I'm here to talk about all things slow pitch jigging. Slow pitch jigging. We are a sustainable seafood company specializing specifically in local products caught by my family. San Diego Bay is year-round fisheries. Visit bdoutdoors.com to check out all of our premium featured content and much more. All right, guys, we're back. We're excited. We love how this um, how this is going so far. Everyone's really engaged. Um, really some valuable information that's being shared. I'm enjoying it because I know the next time I go to the beach, I'm going to have a better shot at catching fish. So that moves us right into our next segment, which will be finding fish at the beach. Um, Benji, do you want to start this off? What do you look for when you go to the beach? Um, is it structure? Is it birds? Is it, you know, current? What, where do you look to find fish? Uh, yeah, when I see birds, but they drive me crazy, man. Um, but uh, structure, structure can be anything. It can be reefs. It can be a small little cut in the sand. The most subtle little cut in the sand can be structure. Um, it doesn't have to be a huge hole. Um, but yeah, I'm just I'm primarily looking for holes. And um, honestly, like in layman's terms, if you're walking along the beach and learn during a lull period, just look for dark spots in the water that you can cast into. Um, that's like the simplest way I can put it. Um, but yeah, looking for structure. I think it's true that like 90% of the fish is probably like in 5% of the water. Um, mm -hmm. you really got to look for the holes. Um, I like fishing a lot of reefs. So, um, reef systems, if you go on Google earth or Google maps and you can do satellite view, go down there and do your homework, um, and research. And then all my mentors that have helped me over the years, the one thing that they said always was nothing beats time on the water. Um, I've made videos on trying to learn structure. There's great videos on YouTube, um, from other people, um, on, on how to read the beach. Um, and those help, but nothing beats time on the water. Learn some mm. of those, the terminology and look at it on the video, but it's completely different when you're on the sand. And as you walk the beach, I think I've literally walked almost every piece of legal fishing area from Ventura down to South San Diego, almost every mm. inch I've walked it, um, crazy and skunked a lot of it. And I haven't, <laughs> I haven't dialed in any of it, you know, for sure, but I've walked it. 
but I, um, that's just an example of I have put my time in. And so now I can identify, well, I'm not, the, I'm not an expert at it, but um, I, you know, it's, it's just a matter of eyes adjusting. And then the way you learn whether you're right or not, if you think you see a hole, cast into it. And within the first three casts, if you get bit, then you were right. If you're yeah. wrong, if you don't get bit, you might've been right or wrong, but you just move on. I'm a mobile fisherman. I walk, I make three to five casts and I move. Um, so mm. um, I mean, we could talk for hours on that. That's my two cents. Yeah, no, great. So you said something there and uh, in the beginning that um, I know Bill was going to touch on uh, in a little bit, but our tech guy on the back end, Gil, do me a huge favor and bring up that picture of that inshore trough because Benji just mentioned a dark spot and I'm looking at the photo here. Man, that is a dark spot. When you're walking down the beach and you see that deep water, that deep water is what you're looking for. So Bill, it's, define a trough, an inshore trough to us. Okay, well, of course, the troughs are, are created by crashing waves. Generally, we have an outside trough and a very inshore trough. The inshore trough is caused by high, or at high tide. And what happens there is the wave just breaks and it just digs out the bottom. And of course, when it digs out the bottom, it not only um, provides opportunity for all kinds of bait and forage to be available for fish, but it also allows the fish a place to go and hide and stay out of the current and be able to feed in. Most surfish are really pretty smart and so they'll figure out the current and they'll figure out where the current is going down that trough and where it's either slowing down or ending and all that bait it's carrying is just dropping to the bottom. That's right where they're gonna be uh, hiding or feeding. Um, but the thing is, how do we find the troughs? You know, if you go to a beach that you've never gone to before and it's high tide, it's really pretty hard to know where the trough is unless you have x-ray vision. So th this is what I do. Ultimately, I go to the beach that I, if I have a beach, I regularly fish and I like to go there a lot. I will go there at a peak low tide and I will walk the beach and I will look for the holes and the troughs and the creases, um, any offshore structure, because in San Diego, we'll have areas where there's sandstone rocks and so on and so forth. And then I'll look back at, I'll line myself up with that trough. I'll look back behind me. I'll see it's the third house that's white on the hill. And so I'll go back at high tide, line myself up with the white house, cast right out there knowing that that's where the trough is. But let's say, for example, I go to the beach and it's high tide and I can't go at low tide. I don't know where the trough is. Well, whether I'm doing it then or just when I'm every time I'm fishing, I always keep my eyes on the people on both sides of me, swimmers and surfers going into the water. If I see a swimmer or surfer go into the water and they start walking in and the water is knee deep and then within a second or two, they're neck deep all of a sudden, I know there's a trough there. So I look down, well, of course, they're in front of uh, Tower 31. So as soon as they get in the water and out of my way, I go down to Tower 31, I line myself up and that's where I fish. Awesome. Right. So I'm getting, uh, like you said, just like when we fished the other day together, Bill, so everyone watching, like I said, we were fishing together up in uh, Carpinteria, which is just south of Santa Barbara. Day one was low tide. Day two was high tide. So on day one, we were like, you were like, hey, when we come back tomorrow, when the tide is high, where we're standing is where we're going to be fishing. Look at the sand structure here. Benji, you had mentioned that you like to fish on a negative tide, but Bill, you had mentioned that you like to fish on a high tide. And Jose here, one of the guys watching, has asked us, "Do what do we fish? Do we fish high or low tide? Is it is it just is it just bookie bookie? Is it either or? What do, what are we doing?" Benji, why don't you start and tell me how you do it? <laughs> it's a great question. I get that question a lot. Um, every fish fishes every beach fishes differently. And uh, spe and the and the species that you target fishes differently. So certain beaches, I, yeah, I fish I fish negative tides. I love a negative one to negative two tide if I can find it. Um, I love it because the beaches that I love to fish, um, it allows that structure to be accessible for me with a cast on those stretches. On a high tide, I can't make that cast at that same beach. But other beaches, there's going to be inshore troughs. Fish are closer than you think, guys. You don't have to cast far. Um, fish come in close, like Bill mentioned, with inshore troughs, those troughs are right at your feet and fish stack in those areas. Water fills in on a high tide. You can fish that. I wouldn't be able to fish that on a negative tide. So it really depends on what beach you're at. Um, mm. And so and so you go there and it also depends on the style. I'm hunting halibut. Halibut, in my opinion, fishes best at a low, low to negative tide. Just my opinion, along with uh, calicos and sand bass, you know. 
But um, if you're fish, if you're throwing out the Carolina rig, trying to catch Corbina, Yellowfin Croaker, Perch, in my opinion, probably a higher tide's better. I think. But yeah. Yeah, so, Bill. Bill, why don't you give us some insight on that? Sure. I, I would, first of all, I agree completely with Benji. So halibut fishing or any lure fishing. So um, the Lucky Croft, the Rapala X-Rap, the um, Crocodile, the Castmaster, you're trying to cover, it really a grub too. You're trying to cover and swim baits as much surface area as possible. Like when we're Corbina fishing or perch fishing, they're right in front of us. They're like 15 feet in front of us. We're not trying to cover. Like if we cast as far as we can with our rod, 90% of our reeling in will be no bites because they're right in front of us. But if we're halibut fishing or we're sea bass fishing or we're calico or, or sand bass, we're looking for structure. Much of that structure is offshore. At a minus tide, not only does it decrease the size of the surf in most cases, but it gives you the ability to reach things you could not reach at high tide and cover all of that extra surface area. So if I was fishing, for example, halibut fishing, I'd be fishing at peak high tide or peak low tide just because there's so little water movement, but I'd have probably have much more luck, especially on undredged beaches that are natural um, at a minus tide or a low tide, because I can cover so much territory. Like Benji will tell you about times where he'll go out where there's a, a, um, a jetty, and because it's a minus tide, he has the ability to get in front and cast around the end of the jetty, something he wouldn't be able to reach at really any other time. So it depends on the beach. It depends on what you're fishing for. But let's say you're fishing bait, for example, you're fishing for uh, a different croaker, corbina, spot fin, yellow fin, uh, the variety of perch and all that. If you're on a dredged beach, so that's Hermosa, Manhattan, Redondo, Santa Monica, Torrance, um, Huntington Beach, uh, somewhat Newport Beach, um, Mission Beach, those are all dredged beaches. There's no natural structure there because there's 60 feet of sand on top of what was the natural structure because they dredged all those areas. So those areas you predominantly will fish at a high tide, two hours before high tide to two hours after because that's where that inshore trough is available and the fish have filled it in. But if you go on a beach like up in Santa Barbara or down in San Diego, like San Alejo, where it's not been dredged, there's a lot of kelp in the water, you'll find it's much easier to fish bait in particular um, one hour after low tide up to high tide because much of that kelp and stuff is on the beach at low tide. At high tide, it's all in the water getting on your line. So if I was to fish at the beach in, let's say, San Alejo, South Carlsbad State Beach, I'd fish at one hour after low tide up to high tide. If I was to fish Hermosa, Manhattan, Redondo, somewhere where the beach has been dredged and you walk out in the sand and it's 200 yards wide, which is not the way it was naturally, I would fish two hours before high tide to two hours after. Mm. Okay. okay. Interesting. All right. So, I mean, we're, we're on the back nine here, guys. Uh, we're, we're about to do the giveaway, but honestly, a question had come through earlier uh, from Kay Wiggins asking about um, Cor Corbina crashing the shore and feeding. And I thought that was hilarious because last weekend when Bill and I were fishing together, I was blowing it. I was missing so many bites because I'm an offshore fisherman. I'm used to letting my Dorado, my yellowtail, my tuna, eat the bait, give it a second before I put it in gear and scream biter. But in surf fishing, it's different, right? Bill, can you explain to me like in like a minute what you were what you were telling me and the other people last weekend about them crushing it in their throat and spitting out the bait and how important it is to get that first bite set? A absolutely. All surf fish feed the same way, whether they're perch or, or I mean, the exception would be halibut, but, but perch and croaker is that they inhale their food, they crush it in the back of their throat, they spit the pieces out and they eat the individual pieces. So if you've ever thrown out a sand crab and you get a bite or two and you don't get a fish and you reel it in and there's, there's no legs and there's no eggs, but your hook is still in the crab, you, see, you think to yourself, how do they do that? They have a knife and fork and they cut around and they're <laughs> crushing it. They're spitting the pieces out eating all those little legs and stuff. And then the one piece that's got your hook in it, they're not eating that. So mm. as soon as you feel a bite in surf fishing, when you're using bait, you want to be tight to your sinker and you always want to reel down and lift your rod up. No swinging of your rod, just reeling down to make sure it's tight. That hook will roll in its mouth and you'll have it. Awesome. 
Well, cheers, guys. I hope everyone's enjoyed this. So I'm going to shoot out a little question here. And um, the first person to answer this correctly is going to win a backpack from Costa, which is perfect for surf fishing. I got the same model. I use it on a daily. You're going to win two hats and a pair of Reef Ton Pro sunglasses. All right. So this is hilarious. Um, the question for all of our users out there, we have a moderator in the next room. The first person to say the correct answer is going to get this whole prize pack. The question is, name the only beach in San Diego that you can fish butt naked. Only beach in San Diego that you can fish with two rods. All right. Awesome, guys. We are so stoked to have had everyone here. Bill, Benji, Anthony, I'm so happy you took the time out of your busy schedules to help us get this kicked off. If you guys want to learn more and more and more about surf fishing, check out Bill's info informational website, fishthesurf.com. Go ahead and follow Benji on YouTube or subscribe to Benji's YouTube channel, BKF. Absolutely rad. Post sick videos all the time. First-hand view of him roping great fish from the beach. And if you want the right tackle, the correct tackle, and you actually want to hook and land some of these great fish, go visit Anthony at Save on Tackle. Um, Absolutely. I, right. So yeah. what, how, how shore bound? What's going on? So if you guys enjoyed the stuff we talked about today, you want to learn more, you want to go more in depth. Um, I work to publish a lot of Bill's work on BD Outdoors. Um, go to our homepage under the fishing section. The last option there on that drop down menu is surf fishing. All the articles from him that we've published are there. Um, you know, if this inspired you to go out and fish, it definitely did for me. I know I'm going to get out there as soon as I can. Um, you know, but also this last article we just published was fall, uh, fall time surf fishing road trips. You know, if you want to do a big trip, um, Bill's picks are here and you can read all about that. So I really recommend check that out. Lots of great information there. Rad. All right. So we actually have a winner. We have Ed Amaral. Ed Amaral, go ahead and shoot me an email and I'm going to send you all this stuff for free. You're going to be so hyped. You got a new pair of polarized glasses to sight fish, backpack to hold all your tackle, hats for you and the lady. You're stoked. Go ahead and shoot me an email, Cameron at bdoutdoors.com and I'll get this in the mail tomorrow or what, you know, whatever works. <laughs> awesome, man. So we're stoked. Um, everyone's happy. I really hope that you guys take this information and use it to help you catch fish. And just so you know, this, this webinar is going to stay live or we'll stay posted in our how to column for eternity. So if, if you took notes throughout this, I recommend maybe writing down the segment, writing down the minute mark that you thought had happened, go to the how to fishing page sometime midday tomorrow, you'll be able to access all this information. So you can get bit from the beach. Rad guys, thank you so much, Bill, Benji, and Anthony. Cheers, Ira. Awesome. Till next time. Thank you time. guys.